everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Cattle producers looking to supplement their hay or wheat forage this winter have an inexpensive option in abundant supply. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Beef Cattle Specialist, Dave Lawman. As we move further into winter, there's different requirements for cattle feed. And, and, and Dave, we usually talk about what's in those bins over there, but we have a different uh, option over here in this bin. This is whole cotton seed. And of course, we've had a bumper crop of yep. cotton this year in Oklahoma. And so we have a lot of beef cattle producers uh, considering using whole cotton seed in their winter supplementation program this year. Does, do, do cattle actually eat cotton seed? They do, it's highly palatable. Uh, in fact, unique thing about whole cotton seed is it's uh, what we call 20-20-20. Okay. So 20% protein, 20% fat, and about 20% crude fiber. Mm -hmm. Rarely do you, you know, if ever, find any other feed commodities or products with those characteristics. High in protein, high in fat, meaning really high in energy, mm -hmm. and also uh, quite a bit of, of fiber. So if, if, if someone finds some cotton seed, which, which is gonna be easy to do in Oklahoma this year, mm -hmm. do they just straight feed the cattle or is there some type of ration they should do? The consideration, I think the primary consideration would be not to overdo it. Right. Um, with 20% fat, now you could feed quite a bit before you got into trouble with too much fat reducing fiber digestion or forage digestion. So if the cattle are grazing low quality forage pastures, if you're feeding free choice hay, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the rule of thumb there is not to feed over about three quarter percent of body weight. So that's quite a bit and more than most people would need to feed. So let's say you've got a thousand pound cow to make it easy. Right. That's a pretty small cow yeah. these days, but that's seven and a half pounds. Well, most people aren't gonna need to feed near that much of a 20% protein product. Uh, around half a percent of body weight is probably closer to what most people would need to be at. Um, and that would be appropriate in a lot of situations. So we have the, the whole seed, but then there's also some gin trash that, 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 that people may get a, a hold of. Is that good for cattle too? It is. It's a roughage source. It's kind of a filler. So, uh, so what we're hearing on whole cotton seed mm -hmm. is 150, maybe 160 dollars per ton. The actual nutrient value, uh, if you compare it to the same nutrients that you'd find in a corn soybean meal mix with corn soybean prices, current prices. Mm -hmm. The feeding value uh, is about $200 a ton. Feeding value of whole cotton seed is around $200 a ton. Right now, producers can purchase it for 150 to 160. So there's a lot of interest. It's a good feed bargain right now. So the gin trash is a byproduct that's basically the, the leftovers, mm -hmm. uh, par portions of the stem, a little bit of leaf material, uh, going to be quite a bit of dirt, so the ash content will be high, but it is it is nowhere near the nutrient value. You know, it might be four percent protein, and as far as the digestibility, it might be forty percent digestible. Whereas this is going to be seventy-five to eighty percent digestible or TDN. Uh, a, a producer comes across some of this this cotton seed. Should they? Well, how, how, long, how long should they feed it? Should they do it a month or should they do it all winter? Well, I, you know, I would, consider, uh, I would consider using it just like they would any other supplement program. So as long as the cattle are consuming low quality forage that needs a protein supplement, they could use the uh, whole cotton seed uh, to provide that need. One thing I didn't mention about the uh, gin trash mm -hmm. right now with the abundance of the cotton crop, a lot of producers are getting it for free. So they shouldn't, they shouldn't think, Now most people are gonna know, but they shouldn't think that they can exchange mm -hmm. uh, gin trash for cottonseed. They're, they're just far different, and this has got high supplemental nutritional value, whereas gin trash does not. The other thing we might mention, Dave, is that, you know, wheat pasture is short. Mm -hmm. You know, our conditions currently are dry, mm -hmm. 
And so uh, the wheat pasture is getting short for some cattle that are already turned out. So people are saying, the whole cotton seed is very inexpensive. How right. much of that can I feed to a steer out on wheat pasture if I'm close by a cotton gin? Right. Well, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You've got one commodity that's limited, another commodity that's abundant and relatively inexpensive. Uh, we're, we're still recommending because wheat pasture, even though there may be a little of it, is really high in protein, mm -hmm. 20 to 30 percent protein. This is 20 percent protein. That's a lot of protein. So we're still recommending if people are going to try to use this on wheat pasture, uh, don't feed over about half a percent of the animal's body weight. And make sure then to fill their dry matter needs with free choice hay, with maybe some gin trash, right. or with some other low quality roughage product that will fill their dry matter needs. That's a lot to remember there. Are, are, are there resources out there to help kind of walk us through the, 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 the other forms of feed? Sure, and the beef cattle, Oklahoma Beef Cattle Manual is a good example. There's an entire chapter on right. alternative feeds and some of those rules of thumb and feeding uh, concerns about high fat and that kind of thing are included in that chapter. Okay, thank you much, David. And for more information on that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. pattern of dry, warm days continues. We've seen some cold days, but warm ones keep showing up again. That's keeping outdoor plants and animals from settling in to winter conditions. The last 30 days have been dry. Our rain map through Wednesday shows only a corner of the state with green where there was more than one inch of rain. Many sites on this map had only a trace of rain, less than a tenth of an inch. Even on a 60-day rainfall map, there is little bright color showing higher rainfall amounts. The green colors cover a range from 1 to 4 inches of rain. Those dry conditions show up on a burning index map from Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. There are no mesonet locations in the severe or extreme categories, but far too many sites had reached the high category, all those orange areas across the state. And the humidities on Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. ranged from a high of only 30% at Westville in the east to 13% at Bernieville in south central Oklahoma. When we check the Oklahoma burn ban map on December 13th, 18 counties had active county burn bans. And December isn't what we think of as a high fire month. Here's Gary with a check on drought and more on our lack of rainfall. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, ho, 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 and a bottle of rum. Now, I might be mixing up uh, Santa and pirates there, but Santa does have a red nose. However, you might need a stiff drink after seeing this latest drought monitor map. Let's get right to it. Well, there you go. As you can see, the entire state of Oklahoma now has color in it. Um, we have an expansion of the severe to extreme drought. That's the uh, darker brown and the red down in southeast Oklahoma. Um, also an expansion of the moderate drought farther out to the west and to the western panhandle. And now the entire state is covered at least by abnormally dry conditions. So we finally gone and colored in the whole map. Now let me show you why. So if we look at the departure from normal rainfall for the last 60 days, we can see the damage done from close to six and a half inches down in southeast Oklahoma to uh, a little less than two inches up in the far western panhandle in between a variety of uh, deficits. Um, if we go out to look at 90 days, we see that there are still pockets at least out to 90 days uh, of surpluses. Um, however, that 60-day and especially the 30-day uh, deficit uh, that we've seen running across the state has more than taken care of that uh, moisture from farther out closer to 90 days. So unfortunately, drought continues to expand and intensify in Oklahoma. Now you may have heard lots of chatter about a big uh, snowstorm coming in for Christmas. 
um, at least as of Wednesday. And if you take a look at this map of historical snow cover for Christmas Day um, across the United States, unless you're in the Panhandle or far northern Oklahoma, you're generally out of luck with less than 10% chance um, of snowfall for Christmas Day. Now, of course, that forecast might be different this year, um, but don't believe what you see just yet. Um, wait till we get a little bit closer. Within a week, then we should know a little bit more. But as I keep saying, we will take any moisture that we can get at this point. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. As we wind down the year, we want to get an update on Oklahoma's wheat crop with David Marburger, our Extension Small Grain Specialist. And David, it's pretty dry across Oklahoma. Yeah, yep, that's no secret. It's It's been for some folks two months, even, even a little bit longer since we've had a significant, significant rainfall event. And so far, the we're, we're hanging in there when it, when it comes to the, re, the wheat crop, uh, the latest crop condition report we had from the USDA has us estimated at 30% of our acres good to excellent with 60% of those acres rated fair and the remaining 10% rated poor to very poor. Now that was at the end of November and the next report will come out to the end of December but we haven't had any rains since that last uh, report came out so I would suspect our crop condition overall to maybe shift some of those uh, percentages in the wrong wrong direction overall. We, we do need a rain. And what does this mean as we head into winter, not quite having the moisture that we need? Yeah, well, for, for some folks, especially those who had a little bit later planted wheat, we'd like to see maybe a little bit more, more growth, both above the soil surface as well as below the soil surface. So going into winter here, ideally we'd like to see plants that have at least three to five leaves and maybe a couple different, a uh, couple tillers that have developed and then some time to get acclimated to these cold temperatures before we go into, into winter, into winter dormancy. Now, another thought to, to that with the smaller plants overall is depending on, again, depending on the type of winter that we have, these smaller plants from this later planted wheat may, may work to our benefit a little bit in that if we continue to stay dry, we can get those plants to survive the winter and we come out of winter and we continue to stay dry, those plants may have a better chance of, of making it compared to plants which are a lot bigger. Bigger plants are gonna require more water at that time. So those, those younger plants not using as much water might be able to hang in there until we can finally get a, a rainfall event. And as we know in Oklahoma, especially these last few weeks, it doesn't get cold and stay cold. We really have some major temperature swings. Yes, and, and actually we, we've been staying pretty warm overall. It was a, above average uh, temperatures here, here in November and, and we haven't really gotten a, too cold yet here in December, but we are starting to get some cooler temperatures. Um, the day length also plays into those plants being able to begin getting acclimated to the cold. So we are starting to get cold and hopefully here very soon we will we will stay we will stay cold and we'll kind of put these plants to sleep for for the winter time let's talk about grazing and some of the the concerns with cattle and forage and, and the conditions right now yeah well if we were able hopefully we were able to get our wheat pasture established and protect it from the fall fall armyworm and if we did that we got we got through that well we turned off dry since so since we haven't had rains you know for two months for a lot of folks, uh, we might just not have as much forage out there as we were hoping to have. So making sure we know how much forage we have out there and we're adjusting our stocking rates accordingly. And for those who have put their cows out on out on wheat pasture now and have begun, begun grazing, we would like to see about 50% canopy coverage for those, for those plants before going into winter to help us, those plants one, kind of survive the winter. And if you are dual purpose, give those plants enough green material once we pull the cattle off um, later on that we'll be able to still make grain at the end of the day. You and the team routinely cover topics like this on your blog and your website. Yep, so for anyone who has any questions regarding any wheat related management for any time of the year actually we try to put out uh, blogs, uh, blog articles uh, covering different topics you know, for that time of year, as well as we put any information on our on our wheat on our wheat website, and then we also try to get information out via different social media outlets, Twitter, Twitter, and Facebook, and we have some videos on YouTube as well. Okay, lots of ways to stay engaged, David. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And for links to all of those sources, just go to sunup.okstate.edu.
lots of cow-calf producers across Oklahoma will consider using wheat pasture as a supplement for those cows this winter. And I realize that we have to continue to get moisture in order to produce the wheat pasture that would be needed to uh, give those cows the protein supplement that they need coming from wheat pasture. If we're going to use and plan to use wheat pasture for cows that will be calving next February and March, I'd suggest that now is a good time to start a mineral feeding program for those cows, one that will contain some magnesium and calcium because those are the two elements that are sometimes lacking in wheat pasture and can result in a situation that we call hypomagnesia or grass tetany. Grass tetany will occur with especially older cows right after calving. If they're on some lush, really fast growing green pasture, wheat pasture is the excellent example here in Oklahoma where that can occur. It generally occurs in older cows because they are less capable of mobilizing those particular elements out of their skeletal system than our younger cows. And it will happen right after calving when milk production is going to be at its highest and that's when the, the need for those minerals becomes greatest. Consider using a magnesium containing mineral mix one that contains about oh, 12 to 15 percent magnesium with some calcium. A lot of the wheat pasture mineral mixes will fit that particular category. I would start it now so the cows are used to consuming that mineral mix. We want to get consumption up to about three to four ounces per head per day as we go into and through the calving season. So we can do a lot in terms of preventing the possibility of grass tetany if we're planning to use wheat pasture for cows that calve in the, in the springtime by putting out a mineral mix starting now, carrying it on through the calving season. We hope this helps you with uh, uh, your utilization of wheat pasture for adult cows this year. And we certainly look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. It's been a relatively good year for production, but not such a great year for prices. Joining us to talk about it is Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. And Kim, of course, we have to start with wheat. Well, you look at uh, wheat and let's just back up and say what, what brings in the income on the farms and that's production and price. At least we got one out of one out of two. We had uh, average uh, production in Oklahoma, 33 bushels. So you look over the last five or 10 years, it's been around 30. So we had above average pr production below average price. Our income is short on that. Uh, however, we've got to look towards the future on what we can do. Let's talk about now the corn and the feed grains. How did they look? Well, you look at uh, the wheat production you know, around the world, well above average. Uh, any stocks well above average. It's the same in essentially all the grains except maybe the protein uh, crops. But but corn production are coming in well above average and, and of course price below average just like wheat. Your net income is going to be a little, little below average because of price. But we've had large production in the United States and around the world in the, in the corn and the feed grains and that's why our, our prices are so low. And, and one thing about the prices, the good news on the prices I think on the corn, on the wheat, on the feed grains is, is that they're, they're on the bottom. They, I want to say they really don't have any place to go, but up, well, they can move sideways. They're going to move sideways for a while, but the odds of them going much lower are pretty slim. The odds of them going higher are, are relatively good. Now, we've had a lot of conversations about a shortage of protein. Yes. W where is that in terms of soybeans and the oil crops? Well, you look at uh, soybeans and oil crops, and that's why the, uh, you look at the soybean futures contract. It's up near $10. Uh, cash price beans in Oklahoma at 9 You're make, The producers uh, with beans in Oklahoma and around the United States or the world are making a profit, and that's because there's a shortage of, of protein. Now, the protein, the good news for the wheat producer is, is that Right now, for 12 protein wheat, there's about a $2.25 premium in Kansas City. $2.25. You take your 360 wheat price, just add $1.40 to it, and you've got $5 wheat. And that's what, 
what we've been, you know, that's what we wanted back in the 80s when I first started into this business and $5 would be pretty good right now. At least it'd get us to break even. If we can get protein, you know, the reward is there for that protein because there's a shortage around the world and our wheat crop is the next crop to come on that can provide that protein. It's hard to believe we're already winding down the year, but how does crop production agriculture look for 2018? Well, I think it looks rel relatively good. Uh, you know, if we can produce the pro if we can produce a quality product, I think we're going to get a better price for it. Now, the corn prices and feed grain prices, you look back over history, they can recover in about a year. It's going to take a while to work the uh, wheat through the marketing system uh, because of all this we got in storage. Now, if we produce that protein, I think they're going to buy that protein and we're going to pay a premium for it. This, this that we have the bin, in the bin is going to take a while to work out and through the system. And all of this, of course, contingent upon the weather as always. Talk about that. Oh, that's a big concern right now because, you know, the drought is starting to build in Oklahoma and the Great Plains. A 90-day forecast is for below average uh, 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 precipitation. But we know that our wheat crops made in March, April, and May. So hopefully we'll get some rain in that time period. If we don't, we're going to see those crop acres roll over into the summer crops. And if that's, that happens, it could help our wheat price because we'd have a lower yield, probably better protein. Hopefully we'd have the test weight, so a relatively good price for that lower yield. But it would impact our summer crop prices because we'd see production moving in those areas, higher production prices stay low. Okay, Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. Recently, I was reading the Oklahoma Animal Disease and Diagnostic Laboratory newsletter, and in that letter, Dr. Keith Bailey, the director of the lab, stated that copper deficiency is a common finding in late-term uh, cattle abortions and stillbirths. Copper is an essential mineral and it has a role in many bodily functions. When we have deficiencies, we see reproductive problems, health problems, and poor growth in cattle. Copper can be comes in two forms of deficiency. You have primary deficiency is when the animal is not getting adequate amount of copper in the diet. You have a secondary deficiency which is much more common is when other mi minerals such as sulfur or iron or molybdenum bind the copper and make it unavailable to the cattle. Now kind of tell whether you have a deficiency, copper deficiency in your herd. According to Dr. Dave Lawman, check your records. Do you have adequate pregnancy rates and calving rates? Are you having any health problems? Uh, are your cattle growing properly or getting proper weaning rates? If all those are normal, you probably don't have a mineral problem. Uh, the second step that you might want to take is do a mineral balance review. Have your county extension educator, veterinarian, or nutritionist help you do this. And what you look at is the requirements that the, that the cattle have to have, how much copper cattle have to have, and then you look at what are you supplying? Where are they getting in their forage? What are they getting in their hay? What are they getting in their feed? What are they getting from their mineral? And is that meeting their needs? If you see a problem with that, then you need to do have your copper levels checked and we can do this in one of two ways. We can do a blood test or we can do a liver biopsy. A blood test will actually give you the levels of copper but we'll never see low blood levels until we've exhausted the reserve. So it may not be the best test to really give you a general understanding of what the copper levels of the herd are. And if we're going to do that we need to do a liver biopsy. Uh, a lot of veterinarians know how to do this and we can get a good idea of what the copper level of the herd is by doing a liver biopsy. Hey, if you have any more questions about copper, if you will go to sunup.okstate.edu, we'll leave you some information there. Hi. Welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk a little bit about maybe avoiding a mess after you've used a funnel. 
So typically we, we take our funnels, and especially if they're long, and we put oil into whatever, some type of liquid into whatever we want to. And then we get done with it, you can't always get your spout clean. Yeah, you can try to wipe it out all you want, but it's always going to drip at, at least a few times afterwards. So you might want to think about just using an old uh, uh, canister of some type. And uh, if you happen to be hanging it on a, a pegboard or somewhere on the wall, then uh, you, could, you could hang this as well. Yes, and so I've, I've screwed my bottom container to the wall, and then I've got a nail up here to hold my funnel, and then uh, I just let it drip into it and collect the oil from there. So keep some mess off your bench or off of your floor. That's it this week on Shop Stop. We'll see you next time. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.